So there we go. So it will actually record to my computer now. So I will have to send it to Chris when we're finished. So hello, everyone. Oh, yes. Welcome to the session today. Um, my name is David Allen. I'm from oh, Midland you. Actors Theatre, which is based in Birmingham. And we do um, theatre productions. We also do a lot of community work and we do um, education work. And most of our work in schools involves using Dorothy Hethcote methods and Mount of the Expert in particular. Um, I knew Dorothy and she advised us on a number of projects that we did in schools. And I'm delighted to welcome today um, Phil Herbert, who back in 1982, I think, 1981, was a student with Dorothy and we're going to be talking about a Mount of the Expert project that Dorothy did at the time, working with Phil, working with other students at that time, such as Eileen Pennington, such as Luke Abbott. We're going to be looking at that as a, as a not exactly as a model, but just seeing what we can learn going back to that, what was the sort of early Mantle project, as just, she was really getting into developing Mount of the Expert at that time. So I'm um, welcome, Phil. Thank you, David. You're over in, whereabouts are you? In, you're in Ireland, I know. I'm, whereabouts in are you? I'm in Dublin. Okay. So, we're also probably, hopefully going to be joined by, can I just ask everyone to mute themselves if they're not muted, apart from you, Phil, if people can mute themselves. Um, we are hopefully going to be joined as well by Jill Adamson and by Louise Ryan. We had a conference recently, the Dorothy Herkett Now conference in Birmingham. And as part of that um, conference, we had some working groups. We had groups that were looking at archive materials. Sorry, I'm just getting a sound from somebody. Okay, I think we're okay. So, yes, so we had the archive working groups and there was Jill and there was Jill Adamson and there was Louise Ryan as well, who were leading working groups looking at this, this project, this Bronze Age People project, which we'll be talking about. But I'm gonna give, I'm gonna start with a kind of introduction to Mantle the Expert. Because I don't know if some of you, some of you maybe haven't done it before and are coming along to find out more about it. And some of you maybe have been using it for years. So I hope you'll all get something out of the session anyway. So I'm going to start screen sharing. Amanda I'm, just, Amanda, I'm just concerned that people might be coming in. And I don't know if I can admit them while I'm going through it. Would so you like to make I, me host again then? I so don't know if I, I need to hand the hosting you. back to you, because then okay, I, you can be monitoring people joining. Let me stop sharing for a moment and sort this out. Have you ever not a little boy? Mm -hmm. Called... Okay, I've handed hosting back to you, but Thank I still you. should be able to screen share. Okay, so thanks to London Drama, thanks to National Drama for organising this event. Um, my company, Midland Actors Theatre, is currently the lead partner in two Erasmus Plus projects, working with partners across Europe, um, looking at the rolling roll system and the commission model. And we did a previous project, which was about Mount of the Expert. And so um, really this, well, this event today is part of this, this, these current projects. So Dorothy once wrote an article the four contexts of 
active learning, as she called it. And these were the four contexts that she defined, four systems that were her key systems of working through drama. And you have model one, which she called at that time, drama used to explore people, circumstances and events. And she was really, well, we'd refer to that maybe now as process drama. I don't know that she herself really settled on a term for that. Um, that's what she was describing it at, at that time. Drama used to explore people, circumstances and events. Model two was mantle of the expert. Model three, rolling roll, where a group of teachers develop a shared program of work based on a fictional context. Model four is the commission model, where staff and students respond to a real life commission from the community. Uh, in an interview in 1985 with David Davis, Dorothy said that while her work may appear to take different forms, in my mind, she said, I've always, I'm in the same place. So this intrigues me. So she's got different models and yet there seems to suggest what she, that there must be some commonalities between these different models. And that was the focus of our recent Dorothy Hethcott Now conference. So this may be, we will see some commonalities today as we talk through the Bronze Age People project. Mantle of the Expert, um, I believe back in 1972, Dorothy was already talking about Mantle of the Expert when she was working with her students. Um, but it seems that from the 1980s onwards, that's when she developed it in a deeper way, in a more systematic way. So I'm going to refer briefly to this chart, which she often referred to in, in her talks with teachers. It's a chart from a book called From Communication to Curriculum, and it was by Douglas Barnes. And it's looking at the, the system in a classroom of communication. So in any event, um, pupils come to the classroom with knowledge, with skills, and they also have expectations about their own role in the classroom and the teacher's behavior. They have expectations about the teacher's behavior in the classroom as well. The teacher is con in control of the system of communication. So you have this social context, which includes the communication system that's operating in the classroom. And in the transmission model, where the teacher is um, the one with the knowledge and imparting that knowledge to the class, then there's a sort of, there's a very strong expectation that the pupils will come to about how they should be fitting in with that classroom, about what to expect in that classroom. Dorothy was very concerned, I think, about the, the way that system, that method of teaching, that's the sort of the basic system and model we have, encouraged passivity in children because they would sit back and wait for the teacher to tell them what to do. I always say that with Dorothy's methods of working if you follow it through it will not only change you as a drama teacher but it will change you as a teacher and it will change the way you think about education so dorothy talked about um yes i use drama but what i do is i use drama in order to change that context and that communication system in the classroom because drama does that because when you put children in a frame in a role or when the teacher themselves takes on a role in the drama. It changes the social context. It changes the communication system that's taking place in the classroom. And Dorothy's argument was that this changes the way that young people learn. It changes their strategies for learning and makes all kinds of new learning possible. So I think it's always good to go back to that and remind ourselves that that's, that's what it's about. It's about changing the classroom. It's not just about drama itself. So in the conventional transmission model classroom, 
the teacher is the one who knows, who controls the communication system. The children do things for the teacher. And teaching becomes a matter of what Dorothy called dummy runs. Um, I remember myself in school being told I was learning things because I would need it when I left school in years and years time. And that's a dummy run, really, because it's not needed now. There's this idea that, OK, one day you'll need it. So you're doing it because you'll need it sometime in the future or you're doing it because teachers told you to do it. But in the real world, I think we don't learn like that. We learn things because we need to know them. If we want to drive, we have to learn to drive. And that, that need means that we make sure that we learn it. So the key thing, mantle of the expert, the key mantle elements are, you've got a fictional enterprise, a fictional client, and a fictional commission from that client. So there's this shift in power. The teacher is no longer positioned in the classroom as the one who has all the knowledge. The client, this fictional client, becomes the external agent. So now we do things for the client, not for the teacher or for our company. There's this sense I find with young people when they're doing mantle of, of ownership, they sense this is our company. And it demands a different kind of talk from the teacher. So the teacher has to shift from colleague talk, from teacher talk, sorry, to colleague talk. It's a change from the typical teacher question, which would be, well, what I want you to do now is to the question of, well, what should we do about this, I wonder? More of a colleague question, because it's about making them active agents in their learning. The teacher, teacher talk, is when the teacher asks questions that they already know the answer to. Um, so that, of course, implies that the teacher already has the knowledge. Now, in Mantle, the teacher has to talk more as colleague, because as Dorothy would say, nobody in the world talks like teachers do, and certainly colleagues in a company don't talk that way. Um, at the same time, in Mantle, the teacher is um, talking colleague, but thinking teacher. So there's an example in the video of Dorothy, um, Foresters of Dudley, where the children were in the frame of Foresters, and a teacher question would be, who knows how you measure and work out the diameter of a tree? Dorothy was really asking the same question in the drama, but in a different way, in a colleague way. She said, we understand there's some sort of rule about if a tree is that big rounded circumference, how do you work out the diameter? Does anybody know? Because she was talking as a colleague, this was a problem that they had to solve as a problem, as a, as a team. She wasn't talking as if she knew the answer. And she probably did, or she had some idea anyway. But she was, there was a need to know this because the client was asking them to do something. And so she was, as a colleague, working with them, trying to solve the problems together. Mantle has been seen, it's a way of teaching the curriculum. So if your curriculum area was ancient Egypt, the children might be people running a museum who are preparing a new exhibition on Tutankhamun to mark a hundred years since the opening of the tomb, which happens to be next year. As far as the children are concerned, they are people running a museum. But the teacher has their teaching aims and devises the enterprise, the client, the commission to meet their curriculum aims. But there's no pretense at any time that this is real. As Dorothy said, the paradox is that this method of working through drama creates a sense of real purpose, even though it's not real, 
um, you are learning in a context and you become immersed in that context and you need to learn things for that context. So this is something that I found recently in the Dorothy Hethcote archive. And this was something that she wrote, um, I think 1981, 1982, it was connected with the Bronze Age People Project. So it gives us a definition, at least from that time, of mantle of the expert. And she said, mantle of the expert is a technique to gain from the participants information and commitment that will enable the drama to progress. The teacher signals that the power of expertise has been transferred from her shoulders to the shoulders of the participants. It should be understood here that the participants may have little or no expertise, but by the investiture of the power in them, this power shift releases what information or expertise the participants do know, but do not realize they know. So mantle meaning I declare that I will uphold the lifestyle and standard of my calling. An expert meaning, and furthermore, I will undertake to take seriously the acquisition and using of those skills deemed necessary for and in that lifestyle I have entered because of my calling. So expertise is something that is earned over time and not endowed immediately. You can't go into a classroom and immediately say, today you're going to be experts. You're going to be experts at brain surgery or whatever. It's built over time and it's built through tasks. A variety of tasks becomes possible through this change in the context and the communication systems. Dorothy said this quote about one mantle, it was like using a kaleidoscope and shaking it up to make a different lens view. So continually changing, continually changing the task, continually changing points of view into a rich variety. It's a drama mode. And she talked at times about how people might say, looking at mantle of the expert work going on in the classroom, they might say, well, we don't see the drama. Where's the drama? But in, it's partly, it's drama because everything is seen through this frame or point of view. Um, her favorite example of this really was, she talked about, um, she was quoting Dylan Thomas, the undertaker measures with his eyes, the passing crowd for shrouds. So the undertaker is always looking at people and sort of thinking, oh yes, that person needs a, would need a very big coffin or whatever. And so what that frame is how we see events. And so that's what is developed in Mantle of the Expert, this point of view, this seeing everything that you're doing through the point of view of the expertise that you are taking on, this mantle that you're taking on. And I think this is something that we need to be aware of as we're developing Mantle of the Expert, it's developing that point of view. So a mantle project, might last for a short time, it might last for a few weeks, it might last for a term. In some schools, such as the wonderful Woodrow First School in Redditch, we do work with them, they're one of our partners on our Erasmus Plus projects, a lot of the teaching, even most of the teaching is done through mantle of the expert with, I'd say, wonderful, remarkable results. So you're changing the way that you operate in the classroom and the way you talk to the children. You're changing the pupils' expectations of the way that you behave and how you expect them to behave. And this can be difficult for teachers to do because teachers have built their way of working in the classroom, their way of relating to children, and that's their comfort zone. And teachers understandably fear losing control. So what happens when you release other behaviors in the classroom? But Dorothy always said, give it a try. Just do 10 minutes at the end of the day. Let yourself be um, you know, stopped by the bell, caught by the bell. So you can start it slowly and see how it goes. This is 
something again that I found recently in the Dorothy Hethcote archive. I'm not sure what, well, it wasn't dated. So I don't know when she wrote this, operative rules for mantle of the expert style. So one, teacher and students take on functional roles, not characters. They are expert at doing something. Two, the doing is always in the form of tasks, which must never ask participants to actually perform the genuine task, e.g. makers of shoes must never be given shoes to make of real leather, etc., with actual tools. Because of course, if they were asked to do real things like making shoes, it would expose their lack of skill. So they can do other things, they can do everything else, they can design the shoes, they can sell the shoes, they can order the materials for shoes, they can do all those things, but they don't actually make the shoes themselves. We're not in the business, after all, of training people to make shoes or whatever the expertise might be. Three, the teacher devises the tasks so as to use and extend the skills, degrees of knowledge, and engage specific learning areas and domains. These tasks are graded and incremental over a period. Mantle of the expert is long-term work. Don't try it if you're not interested, she said at that time. Although it can be, as I've said, it could be just a few sessions. Or you, could... you could just try it short term. So number four, the teacher and students take on more and more responsibility for more and more aspects of the enterprise, ever widening circles. Five, the teacher cannot use teacher talk and must work as colleague, employing restricted code language as experts in the actual word, world of work enterprises do. So, for example, if they're running a monastery, there's a language for running a monastery that people running a monastery know, or a funeral home for that matter or whatever it is. All participants realize that the enterprise is fictional, but truthfully develops. Picasso's the lie which makes us realize truth. Seven, the enterprise must have a history. So certain rules at the start must operate to establish this, but it always operates in the present, presaging its own future as in the real world. Eight, Tasks involve people in doing to achieve the result or the product. Therefore, sessions must feel highly active, driven by intention to complete or get on with things. Gradually, attitudes emerge until feelings drive the action. So she sees this shift between different levels. For example, I make paper in a, in a modern monastery is the first level. The second level, is this deepening expertise, this deepening sense of immersion in the world. Being a monk, I make paper imbued with my lifestyle. And the third level, even deeper, making paper reflects my faith. It's that idea of this, the calling. It's not just a job that you're doing, but it's a calling that you're doing. So as a rough guide, to the structure of a mantle project, um, and there's no fixed structure whatsoever. But Dorothy did say, well, you, you need at the beginning to engage their interest. Um, you need to build the frame, the expertise um, through tasks over time. At a certain point, you introduce the client and the commission, usually through a letter that arrives. They under the letter will imply tasks that need to be done to fulfill it. So they undertake the commission and then finally they publish the outcome. And by publish, I don't mean that they um, literally produce a book or something, but there's some kind of public sharing, public sharing of the work because, and Dorothy said, in fact, well, so much work in schools, what happens to it? It just disappears or the teacher puts it in a drawer. It, it was very important, I think, for her that it should be published and shared in some way. So, for example, if they were running a museum and they were producing an exhibition, then they would show the exhibition to the client, or to visitors, to parents or whoever came into the school to see it. There would be a public 
outcome of public sharing of their work. As I say, that's very rough as a framework, but um, certainly I kind of keep it in mind as I'm working. There are books on Mantle of the Expert, which will give you a guideline to planning Mantle of the Expert. So you have Tim Taylor's book, A Beginner's Guide to Mantle of the Expert. Um, and you have Viv Aitken's new book, Real in All Ways That Matter, Weaving Learning Across the Curriculum with Mantle of the Expert. I recommend both of these books. They're very useful in guiding you through planning Mantle of the Expert and different elements within it. Um, and you can also, there are these websites as mantleofthexpert.com and also mantlenetwork.com where you can find more materials, resources, ideas, tips, and planning models. Um, so my plan today is not to go through, um, guide you through planning a mantle project here today, but rather to focus on this project Bronze Age people. So working with archive materials, this is something that I've started to do. And as I mentioned, this was an element in the, the Dorothy Hethcote Now conference. So working with archive materials. In the Dorothy Hethcote archive, there are videos, theses, documents, letters, project materials um, related to all sorts of different projects. And when you look at these, I think you can go back to what Dorothy did and learn about her strategies, try to make sense of what she was doing. And I always think when you go back to Dorothy in that way, you find unexpected things because she was, I think, she was a teacher artist. A lot of the time when I watched her, and now when I look at some of the things that she was doing, I think, well, what, 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 what was she doing? I don't get it. And I have to work at it, because her work is an endless resource, stimulus, and inspiration. I once planned a project that I was going to tour to schools. We were going to apply for a grant. And it, um, the focus was on Gregor Mendel and Mendelian genetics. So I was very happy with the plan and I sent it off to Dorothy for her comments. And her response was that it all seemed clear, but that there was too much of a research element, she said. And she asked, why should they, meaning the children, bother or care? How can they possibly develop the human caring, passion, discovery elements in this particular system? Without it, she said, the drama has a dead center. She also said that this plan that I developed at present falls into the dull aspects of Mantle of the Expert rather than the varied rich variety of learning tasks which you need to turn it into a full-blooded Mantle of the Expert. And she came up with an idea for um, how we could approach this project, which she herself wrote, said, even as I write this, I realize it's zany. Um, and I still don't quite, I still can't, <laughs> can't quite get my head around exactly how she would imagine this might work. It was quite a sort of way out idea, but she always looked for oblique and original ways of approaching things. I mentioned Tutankhamun, how you might do an exhibition on Tutankhamun if your curriculum area was the ancient Egypt. Well, once Yona, Yona Tower Evans and I, we organized a uh, workshop for teachers, which Dorothy led, where we asked her to look at ancient Egypt as the curriculum area. And her way of going about it was to have a firm of people who made wigs. They were wig makers. And that was her way into ancient Egypt as a topic. And I think nobody but Dorothy would think of that way of approaching the ancient Egyptians. So, yeah, I think we need to go back to her work to avoid the danger that the work falls into what she called the dull aspects of Mantle of the Expert, going back to her as the source and continuing to learn 
from that source because there's always new things to learn. So we're going to look at this one project today. And as I said, I've invited Phil, Jill and Louise to help me. So not seeing it as a model to follow, but what can we learn about Mount of the Expert from it? As we go through this project, we could look at what points can we take from it in terms of mantle work in general. I think I'm right in saying, Phil, that it's the earliest detailed account we have of a mantle project. Um, it was led by Dorothy in the early 80s. As I said, she was working with you. There was Luke Abbott was involved. Eileen Pennington was involved. And it's seen as very much a milestone in the development of Mantle of the Expert. So Phil, um, how did, well, it's 40 years ago, so I'm not sure how you remember, but did, how did the project come about or, or why did you choose to write about it in your MED thesis? I think you'll have to unmute yourself, Phil. Yeah, very good question, David. And bearing in mind this elderly dame, it doesn't have a great memory. Um, it came about, David, because in 1981, when I started doing the MED in Newcastle on Tyne, um, I couldn't settle for any of the themes that Dorothy suggested. They just didn't suit my style of work. So in the end, I just said, look, what I'm going to do is I'm going to base my entire thesis on your system. So that's how it started. And I think during that time on BBC, there was a program about the Bronze Age. I didn't see it myself, and I just heard where they were ex using modern people to have a look for a site for a Bronze Age community. So that's where Dorothy got the idea so it developed from there. I think I can remember that TV series. Can you? Yeah. So there were, was she doing other Mantle projects at the time then? Did you, so Mantle was something you knew about before you came to this project, this Bronze Age people? I, I didn't know hardly anything about Dorothy. There was an Irish person who did the course and there was various workshops in Dublin and she was considered the guru of drama in education. And my training would have been as an actress, a director, and I would have had a totally different style, obviously, to Dorothy, because she was the, the guru. So it was very hard to get on to her course because she was only taking something like six or seven people. So she took two from Ireland and the rest were from the Philippines, England, Scotland, Wales, Australia. So she had this huge reputation. So I was just very curious. And at that stage, I thought I knew everything about drama, you know, because I'd studied Stanislavski theater. I was very good at improvisation. I was used to doing drama with kids. And what was she going to teach me, you know? So that was my attitude, which really I had to sort out later. So we became very good friends then, but I, I started with a little bit of an attitude. And I just said, look, I want to find out all about your system. So she laid it out. So that's how that project began. And so I don't really know what she did before then. I mean, she would do, I remember one thing she did that I thought was extraordinary. She was talking about grooming a horse and she had very young children rushing the horse. And I was thinking, how is she going to do this without a horse or <laughs> without something that represents a horse? So it was my first time to experience drama in the head, mm -hmm. drama of the mind. And then you, you know, all you had to do was witness the way she talked to her students. She just had an extraordinary vocabulary to actually engage them in any activity. And that was just powerful. Was there any sense at that time that she was really starting to develop Mantle in a deeper way, do you think? Well, you see, I had presumed that Mantle was her bag, if you like. Right. I didn't realise she was only developing it at the time, but she was extremely engaged in the bronze project and it was entirely her creation. 
Yes, we worked out, didn't we, that we think it was aimed at a year five age group, we were around about 10 years old. That would make sense, yeah. So it was a prim that. primary school and it seems they were quite a sort of needy group or it was quite a rough area or something. Yeah, I think it was a deprived area. And I can't recall how long the project went on, but it has to have gone on for quite some time because, you know, we covered a lot of work. Well, your thesis breaks it down into different sections. It was clear that there were the sort of different sections to it, yes. um, presumably over a number of days or each section took a, a day or two that was devoted to it, something like that, I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk through things and come back to you with some questions. And if you have any observations as we go along, then please interrupt me. Sure. Jump in. Great to have you here. So Thank there was um, an article that, you wrote together, um, which was for Theory into Practice, wasn't it? The journal called that. Yes. And um, in that, Mantle was described as a sociological and anthropological system of education. Yes. Which is quite interesting, really, because I know that she talked about drama in these terms that she said, you, as a teacher, you have to choose whether you're going to be focusing on sociology, anthropology, or psychology and really her interests were in the first two it was the social and it was the anthropological yeah so she also talked about drama didn't she as a laboratory where we explain the world to each other so we're examining something we're seeking to developing our understanding of it together so i always think well the curriculum in that sense is is the world it's not just the facts of the national curriculum or what's laid down there so in this project, the students were given the expertise of historians, anthropologists charged with setting up this sociological experiment to see if people today could live in the recreation of a Bronze Age community. So the first steps, as we'll see, were outside the frame of historians, anthropologists. Um, they were themselves and she edged them into it. So she saw that this this approach would give students a contemporary entry into the topic. They would be modern day people who were, quote, um, seeking to understand the age of bronze, not to live in the bronze age. This contemporary entry enables the personal spectator in the participant, she said, to be awakened so that reflecting about bronze age existence and not living in a bronze age village is the dominant factor. So there was this distance to Bronze Age life. We're not Bronze Age people, we're trying to understand it. We're at the same time, I think, looking at the Bronze Age life reflects back on modern living. So there's this always this sociological, anthropological thing going on, as in a lab, we're examining how people live then and now. So I think also the drama reflected another key principle of Dorothy's work, Another way in which she was always in the same place, the need for reflection alongside action. So in 1978, she wrote that every teaching tool I have hewn has been to supply and feed reflection on experience. So I'm going to go back into sharing the screen now. OK, so. How did she start? The project started with her writing. Ah, here we go. Bronze Age people on the blackboard. She loved the blackboard. She thought it was terrible that we were getting rid of blackboards. <laughs> she worked once, I believe, in Volkswagen in Germany in West Germany, and they had to go to East Germany to find an old blackboard so she could use it in the project um, because she thought it was such a great teaching tool. And so she wrote Bronze Age people on the blackboard and she did it in this jagged style. She was, I think, very aware of how you could write something in a way that would be evocative and so it was like it was carved in stone, in rock, with a metal tool. 
So in this interview with David Davis in 1985, she stressed that her energy as a teacher always went on building the possibility of thickness, she said. This meant in part building what you said, Phil, the drama of the mind, the imaginative immersion in this world of the drama. Um, and there's numerous examples in this project of this image making, just as you said about the horse. How do you see a horse? Well, she's asking them to use their drama eyes to see something that's not there. So this was the task. The teacher writes the phrase Bronze Age people on the blackboard. The writing was made to look as if it'd been carved in stone and the class were invited, and I'm quoting the thesis here, to turn your eyes inwards and conjure up pictures in your mind of this collective time. So the teacher offers them a model. She says, I'm seeing a spear, but I don't know how to draw it. So these are steps that are outside the frame of the drama. She's building the drama of the mind. There's an introduction here to image making, um, using evocative means of the writing on the blackboard. So then they drew, they drew images of things they knew or associated with the Bronze Age. These are some people from the conference um, doing some drawings. I think they're doing this task. So the, I think it was very important for Dorothy, this tapping into this part of the brain, this image thinking. And it may be something that, I mean, it's something that I'm certainly more and more aware of. The more I, I do these Facebook posts for the Commission Model of Teaching Facebook group, um, I'm very much aware of this as, as a major element in her work, one of those building blocks of her work. It's that drama of the mind. It's building the images in the mind. And so she was inviting them to draw on their existing knowledge. So there wasn't, at least the thesis doesn't suggest, Phil, that there was any input of information about the Bronze Age to begin with. She was actually emphasizing that what they know already has a place here. She says, we are trusting all our own knowledge. Put down, draw, whatever you think of the Bronze Age. So Phil, if I could ask you, do you think that the children had done any work beforehand on the Bronze Age or was it purely just asking them what they know already? It was purely exploiting their active knowledge. Um, to my knowledge, they, they hadn't had any sort of introduction to the Bronze Age. It was completely their first time, as far Which as I know now. Which I think is great. It's extraordinary just to sort of say, well, what? Well, because she's stressing to them what we've got in this room. We already have some knowledge in this room that we can start with, that we can begin with. Louise, I don't know. Louise, are you here? I know, I know you're going to join us at some points. Louise, if you're there, if you unmute yourself. I'm not sure if you're there now. I saw you there earlier, but never mind. Okay. So, the individual image making then becomes collective. So they drew their images on paper and then the group were encouraged to look at each other's work. So there was a move from individual image making to group image making and developing a collective ownership and a collective image making. So I think this is a key element in Dorothy's work and she used it in different modes of drama that she did. Um, I remember when I was a PGCE student and we went to work with Dorothy in Newcastle and we did a drama with her and it was drama, drama to explore people and circumstances events, not, not Mantle of the Expert. Um, we were witches, we were in the role of witches and at um, one point we had a cave which was our refuge and we drew images we each drew an image of the cave as we imagined it and then these were put together collectively so we went from the individual image in the mind to this collective sense of this place we all had our own images and yet it was also a group image it became really a kind of bonding of the whole group immersing themselves immersed together in the drama 
So it's another thing that I think goes across these different models, these different ways of working. And then at one point she said, have we got our gallery ready? Move the papers to the outside of the room like in a gallery so that we can display them. We will look around the gallery and we will see how much we know between us about the Bronze Age people. So it was an extraordinary move, I think. It wasn't just, let's look at these pictures that we've drawn. It was, let's put ourselves in a, as if we're in a gallery and we're walking around. Already there's a, this, this kaleidoscope of changing perspectives of, of different tasks. We are now inside a gallery, an art gallery, looking at images of the Bronze Age. And then, so they looked around at these pictures and then she says, can we, gather round again. Now, do you think we could be as if you'd been in a time machine? We're going to be as if we just visited a Bronze Age community. So at this point, I think there were six student actor teachers who were deployed moved into position to stand as megalithic stones, which this Bronze Age community lived near. They were draped in black cloth and they wore colored masks. So earlier she had told the class when they were drawing their pictures, we'll see the Bronze Age in our mind's eye and then the stones will appear and we'll look up and see that the Bronze Age is here. So this is that moment, really, they appear and it marks its transition from the image in the mind to as if it's real, as if it's there, as if we can see the Bronze Age and the Bronze Age village. And she says to them, now that's the place where the Bronze Age village was. Now try and see all the people living around that place, building things. And so again, she, she invited them to suggest what they were imagining, what they might see with their drama eyes. That's the place we've been to, she said. I saw people laughing around the fire, but I didn't get the feeling how they lit the fires. The children started to add their own ideas. I saw a boat, one said. I saw a bronze age, bronze knife, another said. So there was this, this strange, brilliant element. And then again, one of those things that Dorothy does and you think, what? This bringing in of these megalithic stones to create the idea of the site. And it seems to me very evocative, imaginative, moving into the mythical perhaps, but again, it's, it's theater. It's a moment of theatre. It's like the gallery is theatre. We're in a drama. Suddenly we're in a drama and we're looking around this gallery and we're in the frame of people in the gallery. And now we're looking at this, like this set, this stage set of the six stones and imagining the Bronze Age life taking place in that location. So, Phil, again, do you have much memory of these, these stones and what their role was in the drama? Are you there, Phil? You might need to unmute yourself if you're there. Can you hear me now? Yeah, there we go. Okay. You know the way she always foreshadowed the next stage? Yes. Well, the six standing stones were really to give a sense of the site location. So she had them spread out in space. And she said to the children, you know, this is going to be our site, this is our location, but you can change wherever they stand. So the next stage was going to be where they were going to be visiting the site because they had to see a local farmer to see what area would be suitable for a Bronze Age site. So Dorothy would never have anything for theatrical purposes. The six standing stones had to play a huge role in helping with the development of further stages. So for that purpose, they served at that particular time establishing site location. Because the next stage was um, 
we must, she got a map, a real map out, and they were studying the map as to where would be a suitable location. Am I jumping the gun, David? No, no, this was the next step, wasn't it? Well, it was before, was it before then that they looked through the applications before they looked at the site? Is that, oh, is that it right? would have been, yes, but you asked about the stones. Yeah, so the stones, yeah, was, the stones was, when they actually you. went to find this Stone Age site or Bronze Age site, yes. yes. Do you want to talk about that? Yes, go ahead. So, yeah. So at, at a further stage of the development, um, she had them looking at the area, a real map, to have a look at what would be a suitable area and why they wanted land for sowing crops for animals etc they she said well what would happen if somebody got sick we'd have to be near a hospital and then we can't be too near traffic so she had them in fact you know reading maps thinking about the landscape through modern day eyes looking mm -hmm. backwards and um, at a further stage, you know, the, she had a whole lot of files about the different areas of the Bronze Age, like tools, decorations, rituals, fire, animals, plants. And this is when the standing stones came into their own because she had three of them representing the Bronze Age and three of them representing modern times. So, she might start with a tool, you know, and she'd say, well, what is the purpose of a tool? And she was very influenced by, I think it's George Herbert Mead, the social psychologist. And he was saying like that a tool tells you an awful lot about a tribe of people. So she, they were looking at ways then, how would you make a Bronze Age implement? So the modern day, to, uh, stones would help with the information and ah, the bronze stones would show what really did exist it's an extraordinary device really isn't it to think of it yeah. that way yeah. and to to do the teaching through that way through these devices yeah. through the through yeah. the stones the modern stones and the bronze age exactly. stones it's wonderful it's lovely yes and so but it's very much that that site becomes the focus of it, doesn't it? That Bronze Age site, that village site is the focus of the whole thing. And she's building their imaginative understanding or view of that site, just as with us when we were witches, she was building the cave. It is the center of it is this Bronze Age village. And all of that knowledge of looking at maps and looking at tools, it all sort of is yeah. tied together by that one location. Yeah. Yeah, and it was, all, it was also she was the very first to talk about ecology, really. You know, we hardly knew what the word meant then in 1982. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so she had them looking at sheep paths, herbs that might have grown, uh, grains, what would they have made the bread from, barley, wheat, how would they have crushed the grain? So we looked at the quern stone and then baskets made from rushes, et cetera, et cetera. But she had, she had a file where she had all, there was no heavy books around the place. They were all little paper files with just minimum amount of knowledge in each one to furnish what were the needs at the time. Well, that was the thing, wasn't it? It was very much selecting the materials and it was about then, um, so they're letting the materials do the teaching as well, the materials that you select, yeah. So Amanda, um, I was thinking we might take a short break, but I wonder if there's any points in the chat that you think we should have a, a look at and talk about before we have a break. Uh, nobody's raised any issues in the chat to do with the talk, um, but there's been, there's been a few people with sound issues. <laughs> Okay. But uh, but no, no no hands up or anything like that at the moment. So I don't know if people have got any questions at this stage or perhaps would like to think about them during the break. Yeah. So if we take a 10 minute break and then when we come back, then we can in the break, people can put some comments or questions in the chat if they have any. And when we come back, we'll continue talking through the Bronze Age People Project. And we will um, also have a chance at the end for a Q&A. So shall we come back at five past seven then, Amanda? 
Does, are people going to stay on, um, or leave and come back in? How is it going to work? Yeah, come back in. Do we stay, do we stay and just thing. mute ourselves? Yeah, so if we stay and just you, you mute might, ourselves, then we can come back in 10 minutes. You, you might want to uh, pause the recording. Okay, I'll pause the recording, yeah. Okay, cheers then. Cheers. Okay, so we've got to a point in our story where we have the, um, they're imagining the children that they're been in a time machine and they've seen things in a Bronze Age village in the past. So they're still outside the frame of the drama in terms of they haven't yet approached the frame of being archaeologists, historians. But now that shift happens. And she did it partly, I know, by talking to them as if, um, yes, they're very busy people and they've got different jobs, different research projects that they're involved in. And they shared, she invited them to share some of their current work that was going on. And then they had the task of sifting through applications to take part in a this Bronze Age village experiment. So I'll just screen share again. So here we have a document which was the advert that was used um, supposedly to attract possible participants to this project, to take part in this experiment, this sociological experiment to recreate a Bronze Age village. So she called this the master document or the key document. And as far as I'm aware, there wasn't a, usually you would have a, a client and you would have a commission letter inviting the class to do something. I'm not aware in this case that there was anything like that. You can contradict me, Phil, if I'm wrong there, but it seems like this was actually the key document rather than a commission letter. It's this guide to applicants, which let the children know what they were doing and what they were looking for in these potential applicants to join the project. So it's proposed, it says, to make a study of the ways in which a specific environment might affect behaviour, attitudes, social living and ways of getting on together of a group of people who will agree to live as a Bronze Age community. So then it says the site will be prepared in advance as a Bronze Age site. All needs to begin the project will be provided. For example, Bronze Age tools and utensils, yarns as necessary for fabric, animal, fences, etc. Instructions in fence making, buildings suitable for the period, and working with bronze, etc., will be available before the date of formal commencement. Candidates should be available from January the 1st, 1983. It is expected that successful applicants will be involved in the project until December 31st, 1989. So this was a considerable <laughs> long-term commitment to live in Bronze Age conditions. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and they had uh, sort of applicant <laughs> forms that had been filled in from potential applicants. And they had to consider, were these suitable people to take part in this experiment. Um, I know Julie's going to join us at some point, and this was the part of the project that she looked at with her, um, with a group of people, delegates at the conference. So it was very much, I, I remember one case, I think there was where somebody was always, had, had a lot of jobs. <laughs> so the question was that they discussed, does this mean that this is somebody who has got a lot of experience, a range of experience, or does it mean that they're not very good at sticking with things? <laughs> I think there was quite a big debate, wasn't there, about um, somebody was coming with a child. Yes. 
And so they're going to be in this experiment for six years. So they would miss schooling. So was that a bad idea? And um, I think some of them were saying, well, they will miss the basic things. And so Dorothy threw that back at them and said, well, what are the basic things? And so they were really debating this for some time, I think, weren't they, Phil, about the, the who yes. was suitable and what would they bring to it? So if somebody was a nurse, they would be bringing specific skills, or if somebody had been in farming, they would be bringing skills that this community would, would certainly need. So after that, the next stage was setting up the site. As you talked us through, they, had, they went around the site, and again, they were having to use their drama eyes to imagine um, what they saw and what possible useful things they saw or difficulties they saw about this proposed site. And you talked, Phil, about the other things they did, looking at the map and so on. So then there was this shift, another shift. And this time they, they became the people who were living in this recreation of a Bronze Age village. They were actually having to do the tasks. This is right, isn't it, Phil? They were now the people yes. in the village. Yes. So there's this real move from outside the drama outside the situation looking in on the situation to actually being in it through stages because actually looking at those application letters was getting them in thinking about what would it be like in that village what would it be like having to live in this these conditions what skills would you need to live in a bronze age community so they've moved, been moving by degrees to imagining this place, and now they're actually in this place. They are the people inside this Bronze Age village. And there's still this element, though, that they are historians and anthropologists, I think. There's still this research element going on in their heads, because that's been built in from the start. So they're still looking at it, doing it, but also reflecting on it. It's still part of the research. There's still this thing of the participant observer going on, the spectator looking at it even, even as they're doing it. And so then tasks were given to them in groups. So here's a couple of examples. These are sheets from the archive. So you have your task this day is to make a basket fashioned from the water-loving bushes and the reeds that grow nearby. The basket must hold securely all the woolen cloth woven on the loom and be so made as to discourage rot from damp and moth, with a sketch of what's involved. And then your task this day is to fashion wood from trees, full grown and sapling size, to make a strong, firm structure to secure the winter grain in store from rats and rodents, however small. And so there were a series of these, these tasks that they had to work at. And this, it was here, was it, that they were assisted by the, by the stones, by the modern yeah. stones who gave them information that they needed, and they were guided through the tasks. Yes. And, and then at a certain point, they demonstrated these tasks. And this demonstration had itself a ritual element. So I'm quoting from your thesis here, Phil. The, the leader of each group, Dorothy said, the leader will talk and the people will show the nature of the work. Let the querns be carved and the problem solved. So the group perform the actions. And of course they had to use their, their drama eyes to see the stones, to see the, um, the cloth on the loom and so on. Um, as the group worked, the leader amplified the work intermittently in celebratory tones. The two great stones are being brought from the river bank. The central hole is being carved. And the teacher spoke quietly to the observing groups. As you watch the work, look at it for truthfulness. 
do the hands know the tools? So there's this ritual element, and it seems to me that there's this extraordinary element there of, of the drama, because it's theater, it's theater performance, it's sharing, and yet it's all been built through the task. Yeah. Through the task of, of trying to make these actions as authentic and as real as possible and as truthful to the actual period. Um, and yet it also ends then in this theatrical demonstration. So it's really sort of creating the drama through the task. I thought that was extraordinary really because task is not just then about learning something that is curriculum based. It's task is actually feeding the drama. Is actually a way into the drama, making that drama strong and powerful, having this strong, in this case, ritual element. So um, I just wanted to talk about how Mantle of the Expert might move into this Model 1 drama that we talked about earlier. Because this is uh, something that also happens with this Bronze Age People project. I think we move into the end into something that could be called Model One Drama. So um, she was concerned that she said, well, don't think of Mantle of the Expert turning children into good little workers, because that's not what it's about. She said, what you must not think on one occasion, she said, what you must not think is that Mantle of the Expert doesn't get exciting. Because as soon as people are fulfilling the task role and their occupations, you see them walking tall and they're busying about things. Well, once they get there, that's when you want the adventures of the first kind of drama, i.e. Model 1. So as an example, she described a mantle about a safari park and a possible adventure that might take place there about a rogue elephant. And she said, as soon as people have the safari park in their head, that's when you introduce what I can call the adventure drama. By then, you see, you've got the eye of responsibility and the peculiar angle on it that the person's skills can bring to it. Then the rogue elephant immediately exercises everybody. And then you move exactly into the drama drama. But what you've earned is the thing that you have in real life, which is from my point of view, I'm going to do that. So if this group, this class have been dealing with it at a task level, cleaning, oiling, servicing all rifles as they do every day, checking them out and in, knowing exactly which rifle is going to be where, and the checklist of who's ill, who's sick, who's not in today, who's off duty, who's on leave, and so on and so on. If they've been doing that, and the rogue elephant thing comes up, what's their first task? They don't have to stand there saying, what will we do? What will we, what will we do, miss? They actually are there. So how many guns are out? Who's likely to be in the park? Walkie talkies, get busy. So that you don't put your rogue elephant in until people are comfortable with their work and you've earned them the stature of the responsibility. So in other words, the mantle frame builds that thickness. And in this account becomes to some extent a way into model one type drama or adventure type drama. So as I say, this was also apparent in the Bronze Age project. So you've got this, you've built in this thickness, you've built in their sense of responsibility, their knowledge of the jobs that they do, that the Bronze Age people did. And then there, it culminated in a crisis situation, a fire in the village. So these are some notes from, um, that she wrote for the article that you did together. Phil. Excuse they the children. Me. Excuse me, David, we've got a couple of questions. Would you mind um, if, okay. if I just refer to those at this point? Um, we've got one from Bashali who says, how would she close a session during the Mantle project? 
Would she give the children a specific thing to think or create before they came back the next day for the next session while in role or in facilitator mode? Or would she choose what is to be done depending on the energy and need of the group? And um, Hazel asks if Phil could give any examples of pupils not playing ball and going off task and how Dorothy dealt with these. So, hello, Vaishali. Yes, well, I think probably it will be a case of the energy of the group and what was suitable for the group, whether she asked or encouraged them to go away and do something before the next session. Um, Phil, have you got any thoughts on that? And also whether, because we were saying that this group was quite needy, so if they went off task, any yes, thoughts on that? <laughs> there were a group, they were doing the basket making like it was drama in the mind. So Dorothy just comes over and says, I see we're having a little bit of difficulty here. Let's take this now, let's take this piece of rush and let's bring it around and around. So she put it through each of their hands and literally talked them into concentrating on the task rather than saying, oh, come on, kids. Um, you know, it was remarkable that she could use just the right language and focus on the task by talking to them as if they're adults, you know? Now, as to the other thing about how she'd end a session, I'm not really quite sure. I have no great memory of that, but I think she had three little things she'd put up on the board. What do we know? What do we need to know? Um, that sort of thing. And, and she'd allow then the group to feed back to her as the experts. Yes, um, I, mean, I think that thing about she was modeling a lot, wasn't she? When she, you talked yes. about how she went into that group and she was using, well, doing the actions and very much in terms of using her dra the drama eyes and inviting people yes. to use their drama eyes, she would be doing it herself. And she, yes. she would do something like, she, sometimes she would do this thing of, okay, there was um, one film I saw her recently where she had, there was a map that the children created and she said, let's, let's look at this and imagine seeing it from a distance and seeing the different things. And she did this thing with as if she'd got binoculars and she was looking through the binoculars and the children all did that. And so they were, that was a way of getting them into this idea of yes. the drama of the mind. Um, well, she'd often talk about the truth of the action. Yes. She would say things like, are your hands telling the truth with this action? Like, in other words, are you really concentrating and can we believe what you're doing? But she used the word truth quite a lot. Truth and action. Wow, yes. And there was that, that thing I said, I mentioned earlier, that um, example of how when they were performing these ritual actions, she was saying, observe the hands and observe the truthfulness of the action. That's it. So she was making them aware of themselves doing that. I suppose she that. would call that awakening the self spectator. Are you, how, are you doing it with that kind of accuracy and, and yes. the truth that you're talking yeah. about? So I was going to go on to talk about this crisis, but I see that Jill, Jill Adamson, you've joined us. Can you unmute yourself, Jill? Can you join us now? And let's talk about this earlier phase when they were doing the applications and we were going through the applications. Can you talk us through that, Jill? Yeah, can you hear me? Am I we can hear you, yeah. Okay, so this was the part that I looked at a little bit with the conference delegates a few weeks ago, um, because I was quite attracted to this. So what she, I don't know whether you've sort of said this, so what she put in front of the young people were applications from people who wanted to join the project. And when we looked at the applications as the conference group, we, what kind of emerged for us was the very, very careful work that had been put into these applications. And what, what we kind of came really clearly to as we kind of analyzed them was the teaching or the, the knowledge that you want the children to gain 
is all contained within these materials, these applications. So in a way, they, they almost do the teaching for you. You are pulling them out and discussing them and you've already built into them, you've already seeded into them the things that you want the young people to engage with, to think about, to argue about, to, you know, to, to actually consider and, and it reflect back on what life would be like living in the Bronze Age village. So, so I, I'm not sure what examples you might have talked through, but the, the range of things that we had was there was a 30 year old man who had already had four different careers. <laughs> so straight away, that kind of raised the thing of, well, is he going to stick at this? Because this, if we're going to do this, then people have got to really commit. So the whole process in discussing his application, it struck us when we looked at the, the transcript of the discussion, is that the children were really going to have to think about, well, yeah, well, what is commitment then? What are you going to be giving up in order to do it? Are, are people willing to give that up? Um, we talked a little bit about in the group that given the time frame that, or the time that that project was happening compared to now and the, 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 the way technology has moved on, um, you know, at that point, mobile phones weren't around. That this um, this contact, this constant being in contact with people, wasn't so much in place as it was nowadays. So, to recruit somebody onto the project like that now, you'd be asking them to do perhaps even more, commit even more, sacrifice even more of what daily life is like now. So we kind of talked about that. There were also there there were clues in the applications of the kind of skills that people would need. So we got somebody who um, had done some kind of first aid. So they they were obviously, they were gonna throw up all the medical needs. Well, what are we going to do if somebody comes very ill? How are we going to, you know, are we gonna to have to call on the outside world? Um, there was a couple of nurses who had applied and you kind of think, ah, so that's a discussion about, you know, if people are there for that long, are those people with that knowledge, with that medical knowledge, those nurses, are they going to see us through? Or is there going to be some point that we're going to have to go outside of the group? Um, there was somebody else who wanted to bring a dog. And again, that seemed to cause quite a bit of discussion um, with the young people. Uh, and I think you were just talking, uh, I think you were just talking about the, the couple who had a child with them as I joined the group, um, which from the transcript that we looked at, that, that was the one that they really got hung up on. Um, <laughs> and it, I mean, Phil probably, I can see Phil nodding, the, the whole debate that emerged from that, which was so <laughs> rich, we felt, where is real knowledge, i.e. the knowledge of living in this settlement all this time, what a young person should be getting involved in, compared to, well, they're going to miss all this school. <laughs> are they going to miss this body of knowledge? So it, are there different bodies of knowledge that are more important than others? And you could see what an incredibly fruitful discussion that was leading to with the young people who, of course, were in education themselves. Um, so so what I think what we concluded was that as the, as the teacher the responsibility falls very much on your shoulders in terms of the quality of the materials that you're putting in front of the children and what those materials contain and what learning those materials already contain. You've already done all of that work in order for you then to be able to move forward with all the, you know, the fruitful knowledge and discussion that you want to get out of it. Um, so that was kind of what was really evident to us when we looked at this part of the, the session, really. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think it's actually that that is those if you're going to use this model where you're saying, well, it's not going to be transmission teaching, we're going to stir it around together, then you have to put the the information in the material so you can be looking at it with them and looking through the implications with them. 
So things are planted in there for them, such as the example of the, the child that um, would be living there for six years. So exactly, yes, you do have to put time into those materials. Um, Vaishali has asked how old were they, that we think they were 10 years old. Yeah. So they were getting into sort of very serious, deep discussions at this, this young age through this device of these letters. Can I say, David, I think what it also really helps with is this notion of power sharing. Yeah. Because, uh, like you say, the, the, the materials are there for the young people to get out of it and get stuck in. And in a sense, although you've loaded in what you want, there's a sense in which they may get some that, you know, they, they have the power when they get this stuff to go, oh, wait a minute and take it off mm. the way they want to discuss it and think about it. And so it kind of, I, I mean, the dog situation was interesting because reflecting back just me personally is, okay, that could a whole thing about the vet, a vet could have become a key thing as well. We've got to recruit a vet, we've got animals. So you, you, there's, there's, a, there's a democracy as well when you use this way of going forward. Well, that's right. That's what we were talking earlier about changing the context, the teacher context, the teacher way of working. And so that um, shift takes place in the way that you're working, in the way that you're talking, because it's all focused. The authority goes outside the teacher in yeah. a way. It goes into the client. It goes into the materials in that sense. Thanks, Jill. That was great. So we were just going to move on to talk about the, the crisis the fire in the village. So, Dorothy wrote, they, the children, decided to explore the disaster of a fire in the roundhouse. The contract was made as was assessment of the various possibilities of combustion related with material, watchfulness and responsibility in such circumstances. From then on, the normal activity associated with the Feast of Samhain was developed in now action time. And there was a thing about, I was just thinking, when she did a drama about, she was working with some students in Canada. And they wanted to do a plane crash drama. And she knew the danger in doing that was that you would just have people going, ah, crash, crash, and it would all be over very quickly and it wouldn't be real there wouldn't be the truthfulness in it so she in that case she started in a similar way very distanced there were um, people picking up radio signals which indicated that a plane had crashed and it moved by degrees until the point where they were um yes inside the drama inside the idea of a plane crash but in a very controlled way but they got the experience in the end that they wanted which was of a crisis of a plane crash and here you have, you have the drama of the fire, but again, she was concerned that they wouldn't just sort of go, ah, fire, and run off. And that would be it. That would be the end of the drama. She wanted to build in those elements that would make it deeper and truthful, and I think also maintain that element of reflection. So... There was again this emphasis on task, which she's been building, this tasks that they do in this village. So the actions they performed previously, such as making wicker baskets, grinding flour with the quern stones and so on, were performed again. So there was again this emphasis on the drama of the mind, the um, working with imagined objects, such as the stones, the baskets, the firewood that they collected for the big fire, and added to this, they were imagining the first signs of danger. So she told them, from now on, the fire can only happen to us. We told you how it might be beginning from the newly woven basket there. The fire has to happen to us. I can't deal with it now. We all have to be equally responsible for the truthfulness. There's that word again, Phil. And we're inside a wooden building with a thatched roof and a hot stone missing. On you go, get on with the day. So this was not a living through drama because there was a there was a deliberate slowing down of the experience. 
and I think to build the possibility of thickness, as we said earlier. As the fire was prepared, and this is a quote, at contracted intervals, a stop time convention was used. And any individual could state what fire risks they perceived because of the tasks that they were engaged in. in the group planned exactly how the fire would happen. It was agreed, Dorothy and Phil wrote, it was agreed that a hot stone should go astray, smolder patiently amid new wicker baskets still wet from forming and weaving and eventually leap into hot flame. So again, there was this drama of the mind. She said, at each stop time moment, individuals gave tiny pieces of information which allowed an escalation of danger to be anticipated and experienced as frissons of possibility. So the drama again incorporated reflection alongside action. In the fire drama, the participants, participants created possibility, she wrote, while the spectator within each participant creates and owns the knowledge arising from the combination of possibility, action and outcome. At no point do the participants flee the fire. There's none of that screaming and running around and hurry through to an ending. Instead, they understand. Sorry, David. Uh... Chris has got a question about uh, the, the fire and the origin of that idea. Chris, did you want to ask that? Uh, just simply, um, maybe I missed a bit of what you were saying there, but how did the concept of a fire happening come up? Was it built in from the beginning and planned for by Dorothy or something that the children brought up that she had to handle? I suspect, well, Phil can talk, but I suspect that actually it was possibly a case of she invited them to think of developments in the village and maybe they felt, because sometimes with a group you might feel that, okay, I think they need a bit of an excitement, they need a bit it's, of a thrill. Yeah, but, that's exactly right. She wanted to introduce some form of crisis and it had happened after the stage where they talked about building a house where they could all live, so she invited students to design the house like you know will we all live together do we share a fire is there a special room for a chief so they were saying no this is a democracy we're all equal here so there was something about you know what would happen if there was a fire and then i've forgotten quite the details here but there was something about building up the fire so she had them cutting the oak throwing the logs into the fire, because also there was going to be smelting of ore and metals. And it was then, what would happen if there was a fire? A crisis built in by Dorothy. And then she used the device of distancing it. And as David said, she, she said, look, let's not all shout together. We'll, we'll take this step by step. Yes, yeah, so she said, and in, in, at no point do they flee the fire and hurry through to an ending. Instead, they understand and plot the experience of fire danger as it escalates until finally they engage with the decisions about the choice to leave. I suppose they were choosing to leave the village perhaps after the fire. And the last placement of bodies with consideration of even the last thoughts of such people. And she said, thus drama can fulfill its true function, namely, the exploration of the affairs of mankind. So it seems that to me extraordinary, this focus on tasks, precision of tasks, and that actually not just doing that because through tasks they gain knowledge or access knowledge, but doing it because that is building the drama. In this case, with this crisis of the fire, she's building that through this, through these focus on the tasks, the truthfulness of the tasks, but also this this convention that she's using to break it down and slow down time and say, let's look at the moments and how this happens. So even in that, there's this element of reflection and action going on together. And I can see a comment from Chetna who says, reflection and action as a praxis model comes from Paolo Freire. And I'm sure she was aware of that. She was, I'm sure she would have been aware of yeah. that. But I'm just sort of struck by how much it was that there was this 
you know, this question of where's the drama? This was an extraordinary drama that was being built, and yet it was built through the frame of responsibility, responsibility for the task, responsibility for the village, and the truthfulness of that. That's yeah. how she was developing it. So, Phil, so do you remember what was the experience like for this group of young, needy or children <laughs> in this difficult area? Well, I think they were totally engaged. Mm. And uh -huh. go on. I can't remember how big the group was now, but they, you know, my memory serves me right, they were totally engaged. Well, there would have been the odd little lapses here and there, which Dorothy, <laughs> Dorothy handled or else the stones did. But I mean, there was the age of six stones, six teaching aides there at yes, the time, yes. which is a great luxury for any teacher to have. But as far as I'm concerned, they were totally engaged, as we all were. It was quite a, quite a magnificent project, totally designed by Dorothy, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, looking at it, and I still look at it, and you know, this thesis um, has been going around, your thesis, I, I mean, this is a copy that I got, sort of Samistat copies of this have been circulating for years, Phil, you know this. Oh, See, I never Photo knew that. <laughs> <laughs> Photocopied from person to person, this is my personal <laughs> copy that I've had for years, and when oh, I look at it, <laughs> the layers in it, the layers and layers in yes. it, it's sort of fascinating, endlessly fascinating. So what impact did it have on you and on your practice after that? Well, after my year, when I came back to Dublin, I got a job teaching in prisons. So you had a moving population all the time. But what I was so impressed by with Dorothy is the way she used that phrase negotiating into meaning. And I found that absolutely shattering to, you know, was, to my knowledge, it was just wonderful. Um, like you couldn't go into a prison and tell prisoners what to be doing, you know? So to learn the skill of negotiating into meaning was powerful for me in that context. And as Julian was saying there, one of my favorite parts of, of the project was the letters, the applications. And I did use a little bit of teacher in role, going into role, out of role. And it was all to do with really the communication structure of how you interact with, with students. Okay, that's interesting. So it's a, maybe not directly you weren't doing mantle but you were doing that thing of changing the social context and the communication system absolutely yeah. absolutely well i think myself that mantle is is probably more suited to younger people than older people although having said that she used it with a lot of businesses corporate mm, bodies yeah. she went in and used it from the communication side of things the whole structure of communication yeah. i mean she was a genius when it came to the whole structure of communication, how people relay knowledge or how they enable knowledge. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Amanda, so we can open things up, I think, now to general questions and comments that people might have. And I know we've got some people in the in the um, group tonight that I know, and so I'm sure they have some questions and comments. Um, are there anything in anything come up in the chat? Uh, not specifically, but we have had uh, Patrice actually flag up that Dr. Ruth Sayers had also done her PhD on Mantle of the Expert. I don't know whether people might want to take a look at that thesis as well. Yeah, that's also available online, isn't it? Mm -hmm. well, so uh, let's open it up now with um, questions or comments that people ha might have for me or Phil or Jill. So maybe are we going to say that people can unmute themselves if they want to ask a question, Amanda? They can also yes. type things in the chat if they wish. Yes. So, Chris, maybe I can ask you a question. Do you you trained with Dorothy, and you were famously did the Albert played Albert? Um, but do you do you remember Mount of the Expert being part of the training? Uh, no, uh, she may have been just at the early stages of developing it. But she was in, in the year, I was in the year 72. 
71, 72. And she was very much into exploring people's lifestyles, particularly for work with uh, people with special needs, children with special needs. We are our first real experience of, of, of the teaching section of the uh, where we were out doing teaching with, with her as well was with in Prada uh, Mental Hospital um, and uh, in the hospital school there. And so the idea of developing lifestyles, she said, appealed particularly because they're so visual and immediate. And also, I think they were challenging for her students to self-examine their own body language, uh, to be effective and, and authentic to the role that they kind of dressed up as or had the um, artifacts for, so that the, the children would recognize them immediately as being feasible to be, in my case, uh, a down and out. <laughs> so I don't know what that said about me at that time, but that was the well, role that, a, that we agreed we could play. <laughs> you had a beard that suited the role. I did it? have a beard, yes, I did. <laughs> I was very much, um, and dark hair, and very shaggy looking. So I think that uh, went in my favour greatly. And it seemed to uh, be something that the, the children and the adults at the hospital uh, recognized uh, and and interacted with almost with the adults almost immediately they thought what the heck are you doing with yourself man get yourself <laughs> together we're going to a dance you can't go like that <laughs> you know it's really the low status of the role yeah. uh, was powerful and of course jumping in with Dorothy's uh, course, my first bit of teaching with her at the lowest status role was incredibly revolutionary in my head. And it's never lost me, from me that, that experience of low status roles, the power of the low status role in generating energy. It's like something, it's like being presented with an old house that's derelict and broken down or something and so there's a tension of let's fix it let's make it what it should look like and she did that a lot with gardens that were derelict and houses that were derelict and things needing restoring that whole thing was there and it could happen with with a person which yeah. is what she taught me really it was an extraordinary thing about that power shift again, wasn't it? Because they're given something to care about. Care about those, yeah. In that film, it's those young people who are being cared for all the time, having people care for them, and now given this, this power to help right. somebody in need. Complete in reversal of their day-to-day -day experience, particularly in, a, in an institution like the Prada Hospital was at that time. It was like a completely un, uh, unfathomable experience that they wouldn't normally have they'd be on the receiving end of lots of instructions and so on yeah but, yeah well brian edmiston and yona tyler evans have been writing a book which is coming out next year which is about dorothy's work and that brian describes there when he was a student with dorothy and he went to early on first week or very soon he, they were taken into earl's or hospital and were working with people with um, special needs and it was very much about I suppose as you say it was about being open in that moment needing and being aware of what signals you were sending and, and the re effect and the response that that was happening so it was very much heightening that awareness of, of sign and that is one of the things that we haven't mentioned that word but that was one of the key things for Dorothy was the use of sign I because it's harnessing that power that theatre has to use sign to take sign yeah. and and the, those stones, those megalithic stones, were signs. They were that was theatre, but it was theatre sign that she was using. And it's your awareness as a teacher of, of those signs and how it is affecting the children. Just as exactly with that's what Albert is doing, reading the response and knowing how to push and when to pull back. Yes. Yeah, so to answer your question about mantle of the expert, we didn't actually. That wasn't on the agenda, as it were, but the idea of 
turning the children or the adults into experts was was blossoming it was like present in the background and uh, it doesn't surprise me that you know in the next following year or so that it emerged as a, as a, a a conscious uh well organized kind of strategy but yeah. it was implicitly there in everything that that happened that the that, that, that children or the group would be ex would the power should shift to them having power and responsibility yeah. and expertise implicitly in in my year that I was with him. Because of course it does that thing of shifting that that whole communication system and context that's going on in the classroom and makes them active, makes them take responsibility, which is not what happens when children are sitting back and waiting for the teacher yeah. to tell them what to do. Yeah. Amanda, we me iona's got her hand up i think iona's comment might be directly related to this conversation so maybe ask iona first yeah iona do you want to unmute yourself and come in i thought i was unmuted i am aren't i no you are now yes all oh, right sorry good uh, evening yeah thanks hello thanks for all that it's very interesting um well i was just thinking about you said the dra the tasks actually fed the drama built the drama and built the point of view as well i think as well as the drama and what Chris has just been talking about in terms of the client and or the, you know, having somebody to care about. And the more I look into it, the more I realize how children have to care mm -hmm. about the client in Mantle of the Expert. And I guess we haven't really talked a great deal about the client, or maybe I've missed that, but the sense of how did, you know, how did they respond to the idea of the client in the Bronze Age project? <laughs> And how how did they get to care about the client? And you know, I just wondered how they tapped into that. It is that thing that you know I quoted earlier about you know how she said she wrote in that letter to me about the, 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 you have to have that caring element. You have to have that sense of discovery and responsibility and the caring. They have to care. But it's interesting in this mantle there wasn't really this sense was there, Phil, of this this client. They were doing it because there was a commission that they needed to do this for this um, this sociological experiment. Yes, I, I think it was all really research based. And wh when you say the client, what exactly do you mean, Iona? Well, I suppose there are obviously a range of clients in this case, as in m many of the mantles, but the person or the person or persons or organisations they were doing it for and i suppose partly they were doing it for the bbc i guess is that right or no no it has nothing to do with the bbc oh, sorry, sorry. i think no dorothy just got her idea from watching a program on bbc okay and really the purpose of it was just uh, to gain knowledge about the bronze age from a modern point of view through yeah. the lens of modern uh, viewpoints yeah. Yeah. And it was really a curriculum that she had designed for the children. Mm. And the project was just finding a suitable site and looking at suitable people mm. to engage on the site. Mm. And as, it a, as it was a mantle of the expert, then she would have had a client in mind, wouldn't she? Well, I think it's a case of, I think it's interesting that the, the, the development of mantle of the expert over time, and if we're looking at this as 82, then oh. some things are in place and some things maybe aren't in place as they develop later. Um, there is this, you know, I said this, this master document, this key document she talked about was the application guidelines rather than a letter from the client. So I think it's really interesting to see how Mantle shifted and developed mm -hmm. um, from that point on, because she was still developing it. And I think the client became significant or was put in place at some point later. But I think you're right, absolutely. There has to be that caring element in it. And one of the things that was built into it was caring for the client. Mm -hmm. And that can sometimes be missed, I think, in the way that um, some mantles are set up. If you don't have that, then you're missing something. Just as she told me off, she said, this is too much of just a research thing and not, there's no, they've got to be able to care, which clearly they did in the Bronze Age project. So it's interesting how that was created. We have two more questions, which I think will bring us to the end rather neatly, David. 
that Monique was saying, did a project ever last for 10 years? I'm not quite sure what's <laughs> behind the question. Would Monique like to, um, to follow up on that question, please? Are you there, Monique? Oh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. So at one stage, you said rather casually that uh, she said it was going to start in 18 and uh, uh, tw uh, 20 uh, in 1983 and it, or 1983. Yes. And it was going to last until 1989 no, that's nine, six yes. years. I beg your pardon six years so did any project last for six years I mean that would be no. uh -huh. that was it wasn't wasn't that was the fiction that was in the letter that was set up as yes. this, people yeah. living in this village are going to be there for six years but nobody yeah. in reality was going to yeah. be there for six years I mean yeah. I did think that sometimes she um Projects could last some time. I think projects might even last as long as a year in some cases. A whole year, I think, sometimes. Yeah, yes. a whole year. And I know one story she told was how they had built up the idea of a village. I think they had a model of the village. And at the end of the year, she said to them, what do we do with it? And they said, we want to burn it so that it could <laughs> never carry on. This was the end. This was the final celebration. So no, I don't, I don't think... Uh, ten years would be <laughs> would be possible. I think you would have to do some variety or move on to a different mantle. No. So I guess in um, Richard School, Woodrow School, it's probably a term that they do on a mantle. I know I, I was working Grimley and Holt, which was Richard Kieran's earlier school. And when I went in at the start of term, they would be the children would be coming in buzzing and saying, "What's our mantle going to be this term?" Wow. So we had another question. You yes, uh, this is Patrice Baldwin um, was uh, remarking that actually, if you're looking at uh, developmental dramatic play, uh, children actually adopt the mantle of the expert as part of that natural development. Would, would you just like to enlarge on that just a little bit uh, before we go, Patrice? Thank you. No, sorry, it would just, just that children often give themselves roles beyond where they're rehearsing being successful at things and imagining they are and supporting each other and some and if they're lucky there's an empathetic adult involved who's got a learning agenda so it just reminds me that the seed of it and one of the reasons that it works so well is because it links to the way that children would naturally learn and the, and the way the brain wants them to really and yeah. often school doesn't pay any attention to that at all so, it, um, so and, and i suppose the thing i think which is very challenging is the fact that if you look at the timings of this over years, you know, the national curriculum came in, assessment came in, all sorts of things came in. And I, this is, I mean, Dorothy was a fantastic teacher and she did some wonderful things and she influenced a lot of people's practice massively. And all of that's wonderful. Um, and it's good to see that we aren't losing it, but it's become increasingly challenging, I think, to be able to give the amount of time and, um, and, and also, one of the other things that's good is that, you know, this expertise in some senses, when I started teaching in the early 70s, I could attend free drama courses in London, London draw, you know, I could, yeah. I could qualify in more, I could RSA, you know, there were qualifications, you could do it all. I remember seeing Dorothy's videos at that time or whatever they were, you know, and all of that, we've, we've lost that, um, it's become more challenging. And I do wonder whether the client-based model becoming stronger, I don't like to say this, I'm sure the government likes that one quite well. And I actually, I would love to hold on to childhood imagination and not have things necessarily task-related as well. But um, I'm sorry, I've just got to say one more thing, is Dorothy's book on Mantle of the Expert is called Drama for Learning, and that's what I think it all is. Yeah. So there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Patrice. I mean, I know that schools can can do it even within the con constraints like Richard School, Woodrow School is an example of that. But I think teachers have very much in their heads, they're very aware of how much they've got to teach and that becomes an issue for them. They're, they're, they're scared of having to cram in so much because that's yeah, what the it's curriculum sorry, It's a knowledge-based curriculum, curriculum, that's the yeah. problem. I mean, all these things that Dorothy was doing, the social, the, it's emotional engagement. It's fantastically important in terms of development of people and learning and thinking. Yeah. But unfortunately, we assess everything on flipping knowledge. And actually, you know, so the challenge now, which is always possible because we're creative, is to bring the two together. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Patrice. Uh, we've got uh, uh, one very last quick question from uh, Vaishali, please, because we are now on time. 
Uh, just a very short question. Um, where is Mantle now? I mean, in the modern times, uh, what kind of development has happened on uh, Mantle? If uh, you could just throw some light on that. Where is Mantle now? Um, I think it's it's strong in primary schools. It's um, still, there were some attempts at developing it in secondary schools, Kingston School and Queensbridge School in the Midlands. I'm not exactly sure where they stand. It's been harder to put it into the context, the so restrictive context of secondary schools. It is in different countries around the world, in Australia, in New Zealand and so on. And it has great potential, I think, in Wales at the moment, because the curriculum has shifted there. And I know there's been an interest and the take up of Mantle of the Expert in Wales. So it depends really on the context. But as Patrice said, you know, we are creative people and it is happening and it is still happening. So thank you, Vaishali. And thank in you. In fact, that's a nice that's a nice point to end on, actually, because some did say that this is a, this session has been a, a terrific refresher course. I think for anybody who's new to it as well, it's take you've taken us through some very clear stages. So I think really, really helpful for students who are just finding their feet in the drama classroom, uh, but a very useful refresher for people who've perhaps not been able to do this for a little while. And uh, she was actually making a reference there to uh, the Welsh curriculum. This was Jane Phillips. So um, a very nice point to end on that actually we do have this new curriculum in Wales, which is looking so much more child centred and uh, very exciting. So this, this session has been very well uh, timed. Thank you very much indeed, David. I want to thank Phil. I want to thank Jill and Louise. Uh, Phil, it's been great to talk to you. I mean, this is such a, this is done exactly what I've said, that you go back to these projects and you look at them and you learn so much from them. Just preparing for this talk, I feel I've learned more and more about this wonderful project, this Bronze Age project. And thank you, Phil, for recording it back in 1982. And you didn't oh. think we'd still be talking about it in 2021, <laughs> did you, Phil? <laughs> but we it's are. An, an absolute pleasure, David. I, I couldn't get over the fact that 40 years later, somebody was reading my thesis. I never knew that Dorothy even liked it. People have been so reading it for years. <laughs> No, it's a great pleasure, David. Thank you very much. And Thank it's you. wonderful to see that Dorothy's work is still active and still used. So well, that's the thing, yes. Yeah. Dorothy has got now, it's a living legacy. That's what we're marvelous. All worth. So oh, thank you. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Now, um, we need to um, ask if you would stop the recording because yeah. Chris is about to explain to people what to do to get their attendance.